Good morning, church. Welcome to worship this beautiful Sunday morning. I invite you to stand and let's lift our song of praise to the Lord together. Turn my eyes. church at this time i invite you to turn and greet your neighbors with the love of christ try to meet somebody new shake a hand give a hug
Well, good morning. As you uh, make your way back to your seats, if you would remain standing as we join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It's so great to be able to gather together to worship the Lord God Almighty this morning with you. Uh, I want to welcome you all to worship. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. There's a, uh, a couple of cards I want to call your attention to in the seat backs in front of you. The first is an I'm New card. If you're a guest with us, welcome to Covenant. We're so honored to have the opportunity to worship you, wor- worship with you this morning. That was... <laughs> Inter- because of the sermon, that was particularly <laughs> funny. So um, uh, we also have prayer cards in the seat backs. If you uh, have a prayer request that's on your heart, we would love to come alongside you in that prayer. Uh, a couple of invitations for you. The first is this afternoon, we have what we call Neighborhood Prayer Network. Uh, it's an opportunity uh, for us to gather on Zoom calls in different neighborhood subsections across the community and uh, to ask the simple question, how can we pray for our neighbors? How can we bless them? And uh, if you want more information about that, there's a board on your way out on the right. Uh, and if you're a guest, we want you to know that once a month we gather together and we pray for you. We pray for our community. Uh, there's another invitation. We are are ramping up for one of our uh, most uh, substantial Sunday drives. Uh, this Sunday drive is uh, in partnership with Tomball Emergency Assistance Ministries, and we bless our community with backpacks and school supplies. Uh, we're, we're the leading sponsor of this, and uh, you have always done such an extraordinary job of, uh, of blessing our community in this way. I want you to know that this year, uh, uniquely uh, from previous years, we've had a couple of lay leaders that have stepped forward and provided all the backpacks. Let me repeat that. We've had a couple of lay leaders that have stepped forward and provided all the backpacks. But that means you have a challenge. You join with me in filling all the backpacks with all of the school supplies. So the school supplies are on the Amazon list. I hope that you will go on and help. Uh, Last year, we were able to supply nearly 300 uh, backpacks and school supplies, and we hope to bless our community in a similar way uh, or maybe even more extraordinary way this year. I hope you'll take care of that. Um, Let's go to God in prayer together this morning. Gracious and loving God, what an extraordinary thing it is that we have the opportunity to worship you. So we, we pause in this moment to center our hearts and to prepare for what it is you have in store for us. So we ask, oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we gather here that you would be glorified in our worship, that all that we would say and do would make known, make clear that we submit to you as our heavenly Father. And we ask, oh God, that you would be glorified in our worship. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, dearly beloved, Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament of baptism are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of Jesus when he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So I ask now, Brad and Haven Pearson, these questions that are our profession of faith and our commitment to discipleship in our own families, 
On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you uh, accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you accept and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church? And finally, will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Brothers and sisters, together uh, we have a commitment to make as well because we are one family as the body of Christ. So will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? If you would, would you join me in saying, with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in the service to others We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. All right, come on, Campbell. Eternal Father, through your mighty acts of salvation, you have made yourself known through water. From the moving of your spirit upon the waters of creation to the deliverance of your people through the flood and through the Red Sea. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb, baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. So now we ask, O God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, wash away their sin, clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they would share in his final victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What name is given this child? Hi, Sydney. How are you? Sydney loves her mama and her daddy, so we're going to make sure that she sees them. Hey. Hey. Sydney Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God add his richest blessings upon you all the days of your life. Amen. Sydney, hey, look, your family. Look, you have all of these people. You have brothers and sisters. And you see Campbell over there, I know. But look, you have, oh, the mapes are here. Hi, Mapes. Look, they're right there. And do you see? You have aunts and uncles and moms and dads and sisters and brothers. And together, we all have made commitments to support you. And just as Jesus invited the children to come, so we invite you into our family. And we pray, oh God, that you would bless Sydney Rose, that you would give her enough tears to make her tender, enough hurts to make her humane, and enough failures to know that all her successes come from you. And finally, gracious God, we ask that you would help us to be a window through which she would see you and understand you as her heavenly Father so that she would come to know your son Jesus Christ, his grace and his love, and to follow her all her days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You did so good. Sydney, everybody, let's welcome the newest member of the family of faith. Let's continue in worship together. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, church, uh, I understand that all of us may be coming into this morning's service of corporate worship with a whole range of different experiences already this morning. Um, I know this uh, because I have come into settings of corporate worship, services of worship from a whole range of different places and spaces in my own heart throughout my life. I know that sometimes it's easy 
to walk into the sanctuary and to lift your heart to the Lord in, in love and honor and respect and reverence. It's easy to sing the songs because the songs are the cry of your heart at that time. But I also know from personal experience that some days you walk into the sanctuary and it's not so easy. It's not so easy maybe because uh, the songs that we're singing don't line up with the cry of your heart at that time. Maybe you're going through a challenge. Uh, Maybe you've had a morning or a weekend that's wrought with sin and you're feeling distant from God. And so it's hard to sing because there's something else that's getting in the way that needs to be processed first in your relationship. Uh, So I'm going to just, acknowledging that, give us a few moments to pray, to meet with the Lord. If you need to resolve some conflict with the Lord, do some conflict resolution with the Lord. His arms are open. His smile is towards you. His heart is for you. Uh, And if you're in a joyful space of worship already this morning, just look inward and, and abide in that joy, abide in that peace. And as we continue and sing in just a few moments, this is a space of freedom. If you like to stand when you sing or you want to sit or some of both, this is just between you and God. So why don't you just take a few moments now to prepare your hearts and then we'll sing. hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of your sin that Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well that Jesus is calling to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ leave behind your regrets and mistakes Today there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are rolling wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Go come to the altar. The Father's arms are rolling wide. Forgiveness was bought with.
imaginations this morning. Help us to remember to put creativity and imagination into these words. As we remember and imagine Jesus, what you did, let it move our hearts in love and worship and thanksgiving. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. Think back. His body bound and drenched in they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the The Son of Heaven rose out again. Come on. Oh, trample. And I will rise 
among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Just abide with him in your heart, turn your mind's eye to him. confess that uh, in our lives we often don't honor you with our time or, um, or our thoughts, our words, or our actions, Lord. I pray that you would uh, rekindle in us uh, a passion for you. And uh, Lord, we, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time we dismiss the kids to head back to Cove kids to dig into God's word, to have fun together as you come to know one another and come to know what God has for you. Uh, together here in the space, we're going to turn our attention to God's word in uh, Psalm 115, uh, the entire uh, psalm. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there. If not, you can follow along with the words on the screen. As folks are turning, uh, I have uh, a word of... Um, Information, non-information, announcement, non-announcement sort of a thing, like just to be totally clear and, and muddy at the same time. Uh, I know that there's been a lot uh, going on uh, in the world with regard to uh, the United Methodist Church. You might have seen some uh, reports. You might have had conversations with one another uh, in the commons before after church or at different uh, covenant gatherings over the last few weeks. Uh, I, I want you to know that our, our, our church council, which is our leadership board, uh, is, is in conversation about what the, the right next step will be. And I want you to hear that uh, on uh, July 31st, two weeks from now, you as a church will hear more about Covenant's response and our next steps together. So uh, that is uh, the non-announcement announcement, the fully muddy here we are just so everybody knows that this is something that conversations are uh, going on about in the background. So now let's turn our attention to God's word, to Psalm 115. Uh, let's hear together what the Lord has for us today. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Because of your love and faithfulness, 
Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever, he, uh, whatever pleases him. But their idols, their idols are silver and gold made with human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses that cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. And feet that cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. All you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praise the Lord. Those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord and so we give him thanks and praise. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God. What an extraordinary gift it is to come together around your word to know that you have given us your heart. It's contained in your word if we would but seek it. Come to know you more and more through it. Lord, we pray that you would be present with us by the power and working of your Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, you would be glorified and honored in this space and time. Lord, open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear, open our minds that would come to know and understand your word, our hearts that we would feel its power. Then we ask, O oh God, in response, that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in a series of meetings recently, and, and uh, the, the, the meetings were, were difficult and challenging, and we were dealing with some intricate matters, and, and at the end of it, there was the meeting after the meeting. Do you, do you know about those? Uh, either the hallway or the parking lot or maybe the text stream. I mean, something you, you could like relate to your corporate world, the meeting after the meeting. I was in the meeting after the meeting and I just uh, got caught up and I was lingering until I was one of the last, the very last two people there. Have you ever been one of the last two? So I was one of the last two people there and the person that was there with me turned to me and said, Jason, you were made for this. That, that seemed like a, like a, a, a fairly grand statement because what I was feeling the entire meeting and in the meetings after the meeting was uh, a grand insufficiency. Like I didn't know what the heck I was doing, right? Uh, and, and sometimes you feel like you're just faking it till you make it. And then someone says you made it and you're like, ha, fooled you. Um, or maybe there was something at work in you or in me that's able to, uh, to supply us with gifts according to the measure of need that's before us. So I began to wonder, what am I made for? What are you made for? What are you made for? And we know that, that each and every person here has specific glorious gifts that, that, that are, are worthy of celebration and giving praise and honor to the one from whom they derive. And, and we know that at the body, we are part of one body. And as a body, we have many members and each member has a function and the Lord is going to use us for these functions. And so when I ask you, what are you made for? You might still be saying, I'm still figuring that out. 
Or you might be saying, there's this gift that I've been given, and I'm made to use that. There, there are individual gifts and there are things that we're individually made for, but there's also the, this grand corporate uh, 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 creation that we share in. And, and I want you to know each and every person has been made for something uh, that, that is not unique to you, but is held in common one with another. You could, you could look around the room and you could think to yourself, everyone here has been made for this. You and I, we have been made to worship. We've been made to worship, which means that we have the capacity to know and understand the one uh, that we worship and and why we worship him. And we have uh, the ability to be in relationship with him such that that we can uh, uh, offer our attention, our devotion, our worship to him. How do I know that we were made for worship? Because you and I will worship whether or not we're worshiping God. We will always find something or someone to worship. You're like, oh, okay, I see where we're going. Yes, you, you and I will find something or someone to worship and, and so when, whenever we draw in a little bit closer here, we start to wonder, what is it that we worship? You were made to worship. My buddy Ben Trammell uh, grew up at Lakewood Methodist Church over in Cyprus, Jones and, and, uh, and Luetta. And uh, he remembers in, in the early 90s, he's eighth or ninth grade, and he goes to worship. And uh, it's sanctuary service, traditional uh, UM service, uh, and he remembers the prelude that morning. And, you know, the organ, boom, 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 and the pipes are rattling, and everybody's like, yeah, we're going to worship. And uh, is that, that's how it goes, right? And, uh, and so... And so the organ plays the prelude, and then they, they stand and they sing the hymns from the hymnal, and, uh, and, and they all are kind of uh, corporately worshiping together. And then after the, the hymns, the, the choir sings an anthem, and they have their robes uh, with their little V collars, and, and there's always the dude that has it backwards. Like, how, like, you are in the choir, learn which direction the V goes. And, and so uh, he's remembering and recalling this circumstance. And then the pastor gets up to preach the sermon and he opens the Bible to a book that's not often open to of the Bible on Sunday mornings. And it's Revelation chapter 4, hmm, verse 8. And, it, and he begins to read. Day and night, they never stopped worshiping God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And the pastor uh, closed his Bible, prayed, and began to proclaim. And, and the, the pastor said, Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Hear the good news. What we are doing right now, this, this thing that we've experienced with the organ and the hymnal and the choir and the preaching, the scripture says we get to do that forever. Now remember, he was an 8th or ninth grade boy, and all of a sudden it struck him, if this is what it is forever, I... Like... Like, I don't know if that's what forever should look like. And Ben was telling me this story, and I was like, hey, Ben, but what if it was like, like a rock band? What if it was contemporary Christian worship? He was like, no. Do you remember the 90s? <laughs> we tried it. I could sing of your love forever. Right? Like, like and we sang I could sing of your love forever? Forever. <laughs> we really did. Like, it, it, was, it was 20 minutes of the same line. And, and so if you begin to imagine your preacher coming to worship and saying, look, this is the thing that will be eternal. 
and you're like, man, I really love like football or I really love hanging out with my friends or like there's a lot of things you could tell me I'm going to do forever but this organ hymnal choir I could sing of your love for everything ah and that's because we have a totally like messed up like constrained view of what worship is we we have this idea that worship is in this place at this time, for a certain particular length of time, and if it goes over, we have some problems. Uh, and, and it does this certain thing. It goes in this certain order. It has this predictable rhythm. It's, it, it's, it's dependable in this way. And it can be isolated to one hour, but not at Covenant, 65 to 70 minutes. If you've ever been wondering, 65 to 70 minutes on Sunday is the target. So if I go over 70, then like give me the stank, right? But, uh, but you know, some of y'all looking, especially when we have guests, boy, it rolls around to 60 minutes and they're like, like ansing around. I'm like, hey, Covenant's 65 to 70 minutes. All right, I'm, ba- I'm back, I'm back. So, so we have this view of worship that it's this thing that's done in this place and this time for a certain length of time. But that's not a biblical view of worship. That's not an eternal view of worship. And we need to break our minds open so that we could receive this glorious image of worship that goes so much deeper and so much further beyond that constrained vision. And in order to do that, one of the things the psalmist uh, orients us in here is is the differentiation between uh, what worship is when you are worshiping God and what worship is when you are worshiping an idol. And and the psalmist is trying to move the people of God from worship for uh, from idolatry for worship. And so this this movement is is very important for us today as it has been important for every generation before us. And most commonly, idolatry is the worship of something that is not worthy of that worship. Well, that helps to clear things up because I'm not worthy and you're not worthy. And, and the things that we oftentimes find ourselves worshiping, they're, they're not worthy. And so idolatry is worshiping a thing that is unworthy of worship. There is only one that is worthy of our worship, and that is the Lord God Almighty. And so when you set up this parallel, this, this, this system of evaluation, what is worthy and what is not. It, oftentimes, our idols today, our idols are activities or ideas. Our idols are oftentimes people. Our idol is most often ourselves. Activities, ideas, people, self. Most common idols, I think, for us today. But there's one other form of idol that the author of the psalm is particularly inviting us to consider, and that is stuff, things. And so I want us to actually like dive into that in a a moment of, of reflection. I want you to consider what thing... Have I lifted up into the place of idol in my life? What stuff have I established as an idol? I'm giving you enough time to actually think, right? Self-evaluation, self-reflection. Where in my life have I elevated something or some stuff to a position or place of idol? How would I know? Are you devoted to it? Is your attention focused on it? Not only when you're with it, but when you're not? Do you spend your resources on it? Where are you placing your energy? What thing, what stuff has become an idol in your life? Now, for some of us, it's going to be something that that we depend on, we think. We think that this thing we depend on, and and so for some of us, we might have 
begun to think about that thing that is always everywhere with us. You know, uh, we, we, were, we were sitting uh, at, at, at the, the island uh, at our house the other day, and my wife Lauren had her phone out on, on, the, on the counter, and uh, we all had just eaten, so our drinks were still there. My beautiful, lovely 18-year-old daughter, Addison, uh, was gesturing as she was talking, and... You know, the, you know the drill. The drink goes, phew. And where does it go? It doesn't go on a napkin. It doesn't go just on the floor. Uh, it doesn't go into the sink. It goes right onto my wife Lauren's phone. Well, well what do you think whenever that happens? Sometimes you think, um, we're going to talk with our daughter. <laughs> Sometimes you think about how much it's going to cost, some, but, but really what has begun to go into our minds in our home whenever we have had our phones damaged is this idea, what am I going to do, how am I going to function between now and when it gets repaired? Because... We have created our lives, ordered our lives, such that we believe that we depend on our phones. And the Burnhams are the only ones I could tell. So um, some of the other things that we might, uh, some of the ways that we might be able to determine whether or not we have an idol of things or stuff might be the ways in which we hold something with value. We identify it as being particularly, uniquely valuable. Oftentimes, that's found in the way we value our homes. Not always. Some of you, eh, whatever, it's a house. Some of you are like my friend Jamie, who once a week on Fridays, after she dropped her boys off at school, she took out the can of touch-up paint and went around the entire house and touched up the house paint every single Friday. Some of you aren't laughing because that's you. That's all right. That's a bless you as well as I bless my friend Jamie, right? This is like, where do you place value? And, 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 and what things do you hold that value so tightly that your attention, your focus, your energy, your effort, your desire, your money is all there? And for some of us, it's our homes, or other things we place value in? What is that thing or that stuff that you have elevated to a position of idol in your lives? Others of you, as you thought, you thought of that thing that brought you into connection with a memory or a person or a moment. You thought of that thing that you could not imagine not keeping forever. Maybe it belonged to your mom or your dad or your wife or your husband. And that heirloom has taken on an identity so much greater than what its actual physical value is and you have elevated it to a whole different place in your life. As the psalmist uh, describes uh, the connection that we have all too often with things and stuff, uh, the the psalmist wants us to, to, to get clear, to order our attention on the differentiation between God and things. And, and it's all in the framework of, of, of the culture that the psalmist is writing in and the culture that uh, continues on through Jesus' day and beyond. You know, you think, of, uh, you think of the people of God as, as they left Egypt and, and, and were saved through the sea, and then they enter into the wilderness. And while they're in the wilderness, uh, Moses goes up, meets with the Lord. The Lord is giving Moses direction. And while he is gone for, a, oh, too short a period of time, or maybe too long because of what took place, the people of God do what? 
They take off their earrings. They take off their rings. They go and get their plates and their cups, anything that is made of metal, and they, they liquidate that metal and they craft a golden calf, a physical representation of another god so that they had something to worship. Paul describes a similar reality in in the book of Acts chapter 17. He is ministering uh, all across his missionary uh, um, journeys and he comes to Athens. And while he's in Athens, uh, he, he has opportunities to preach and to teach. But at very first, when he enters Athens, he evaluates the community that he's been called to reach with the good news of Jesus Christ. And it begins in, in verse 16. We're going to read just three different pieces to show what Paul encountered there. Verse 16 says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Okay, so he sees that there are idols in the marketplace, that there are idols in the homes, that there are idols in the temples, that everywhere he goes, from home to corporate worship settings, idols everywhere. And then in verse 22 and 23, He has opportunity to teach. Here's what he says. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and says, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Maybe God would say that to us as well. I see that you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are very ignorant of the thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So he says, I've evaluated your community. I see idols in your homes, in your marketplaces, in your temples. I even found one that said that this is to an unknown God where you are identifying that You're directing your worship, but you don't understand the one that you want to worship. Maybe that's us as well with the things, the stuff we worship. Maybe it's just showing how we are made to worship. But when we misplace that worship, we are acknowledging that we actually don't know the one that we were made to worship. And then finally, verse 29 and 30, it says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. God commands all people everywhere to repent. And so as the psalmist comes into this uh, ongoing testimony of God for the world, not just the people of God, and he says uh, there are these physical idols, these things, this stuff that, 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 that are made by human hands. But think how worthless actually they are. How they will decay, how they will rust, how they will deteriorate, how they do not have the lasting capacity that we wish they did. Think about your idols And here's how the psalmist frames it. He says, your idols, you could could craft them with hands, but they can't touch you. You could craft them with a mouth, but they can't say a word to you. You craft your idols with ears, but they don't hear you. You craft your idols with feet and legs, but they don't walk with you. And so, the psalmist call to you and to me today is to know that we worship a living God. 
We worship a God who has a mouth, who gives words to us, who teaches us and leads us and guides us by his very voice. We have a God who has heard every single prayer of your heart and of your lips. We have a God. We have a God who sees you in the midst of your joy and your trouble, and he walks with you all along the way. We have a God who reaches out and touches your heart with the power and working of his Holy Spirit, saying to each and every one of you, I love you. I love you. I love you so much that I gave my son for you. And through his sacrifice and mine, I have made a way for us to be together forever. And that is worthy of worship. That is a God to worship. And so whatever idol comes to mind, whether it's a, a thing or stuff, whether it's people, activity, self, or idea, whatever idol comes to mind for you, I want you to know today that it is worthless. And those things have no lasting capacity. In fact, they lead to death. But we worship a living God who gives life to each and every one who call upon his name. May we worship him because he is worthy. And may we do it forevermore. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, what an extraordinary gift it is to know that you are moving and that you have your being amongst us, that, that, that you are with us, and that you call out to us and invite us into a relationship with you. So I pray, oh God, I pray that we would enter in, that we would respond, that our hearts, uh, that our hearts would be open to receive your grace and love. Lord, we, we are tempted daily, every day, to worship something else, someone else. Lord, we are here proclaiming they're not worthy, but you are. And so we seek to worship you all the days of our life and forevermore. As we continue in worship and enter into this time of offering, Lord, we pray that you would use these gifts for your glory, honor, and praise. And we also ask, oh God, that you would, that you would be glorified in the givers as well, that in our generosity, in the joy of giving something away, we would, we would be reminded of what it means to, to follow you. Lord, be glorified in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the ushers come forward for this morning's offering? Ever be on my lips, 
ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my I invite you to stand. We're going to sing one final song together. We learned it last week, but it's still new, especially if you weren't here last week. So I invite you to learn this song and then we'll sing it together. Sing Wandering. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me. another one I am free I am free I am free hell lost another one I am free I am free I am
well, uh, this is a special uh, opportunity we have. We have a, a student ministry team heading out on mission trip today, going to San Antonio, where we partner with Blueprint Ministries. If you are going on mission trip today with the student ministry team, would you come up here so that the congregation could bless you? Come on. Here we go. We have some bashful folks. That's all good. Oh, all right. There we come. Here we come. Uh, we, I'll also say we got Morgan in the back running this. Come on. Come on down. So uh, I invite you to extend your hand in blessing. We're going to offer a word of blessing and a dismissal as well. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these students and leaders that they, uh, that they have given of themselves and their time, and they're offering it to you. We pray, O oh God, your blessing upon them, that you would sustain them with energy and purpose this week, that you would be glorified in the way they minister uh, over the course of this week. We pray for all of uh, the, the households that they will encounter. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be a source of encouragement and love, grace and blessing. And we pray, O oh God, that you would, uh, that you would protect this team uh, with, with a, a heavenly host that you would safeguard them on their journeys and travels and protect them in their work. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for opportunity we have to worship you this morning. Lord, let our whole lives be worshiped to you so that we might have the great joy and benefit of worship, worshiping you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.